Coming up on this week's show, Kate McMurray is here and she talks to us about her latest book, See the Light. This is the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of gay romance fiction. Each week, we bring you exclusive author interviews, book recommendations, and explore the latest in gay pop culture. Welcome to episode 173 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff from jeffadamswrites.com, and with me, as always, is my co-host and wonderful husband, Bill Kenhouse. Hello, everyone. This episode of the podcast is brought to you in part by our remarkable group of supporters on Patreon. A big thanks to Sheila for joining us, and we'll have information on just in just a few minutes about how you can join Sheila and the rest of our patrons. Yeah. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming back and joining us for another brand new episode. Another week, another shoe, as they say. Uh, we <laughs> hope you had uh, a terrific week. Uh, got lots of great books read. Indeed. We, we have... We have managed to, for the first time in podcast history, uh, both of us have read uh, not only the same book, but we've read two books at the same time, and we're going to be doing some joint uh, reviews coming up later in the show. Yeah, it's rare enough for us to get one book done, but to do two. Mark this down in the podcast history, <laughs> folks. It may never happen again. <laughs> uh, so, what's been going on this week? Uh, I had a book release, uh, Head in the Game, which is a MM hockey romance with a little May-December flair, uh, came out on Thursday. I released it uh, for All-Star Weekend, because uh, this past weekend was NHL All-Star Weekend. Uh, I've got a single blog tour stop on this. It's not even really a tour. It's, it's a single stop uh, with Joyfully J. And uh, there you can check out a little post about the book, an exclusive excerpt, and I've also got two a chance for two people to win an ebook copy and a five dollar Amazon gift card. You can check out the show notes for a quick and easy link to that post. Uh, the giveaway is open through January thirtieth, so if you're catching us on the in the early part of the week, you can still get in there and check that out. And yeah, thank you to everybody who's picked up Head in the Game. It's been uh, very cool to see it get picked up in some of the early reviews too. Mm -hmm. Now, one of your books has hit a particularly interesting uh, and special milestone. It has, yeah. Now, I've actually known about this milestone for over a year now. It's a little ridiculous. Uh, but I finally have it. So the first book in the Codename Winger series has come out in paperback. Let's just take a moment no, here. Heart, hard hardback. Back. Sorry. Let's take a moment here. <laughs> yes, hardback. Uh, this came out December 2017. I don't quite remember when I stumbled onto it. It was actually some months after that. I was on the Tracker Hacker Amazon page for God knows why. I might have needed the link or checking something or whatever. But I'm like, hardback? What? <laughs> Turns out Harmony Inc. puts out hardbacks for many of its titles uh, for library distribution because, you know, libraries are kind of into hardbacks because they hold up better. Um, and I'm like, I got in contact. I'm like, how do I, can I get one of those? Do, is there an author copy available for that? And uh, there was a little kerfuffle with the shipping and I finally got it. And I have to say that I had a moment of all the feels seeing the book in hardback. I mean, it's exactly the same book. It's this interior is the same. It's the same guts, but just this extra little, you know, firm book. I, I grew up in a house. My mom loved hardbacks um, and it, if, if the book came out in hardback and there's an author she loved, she'd get it. She had shelves full of the hardbacks. Um, I buy hardbacks for authors I really love to this day. And, you know, our genre doesn't produce many hardbacks. Uh, the romance genre, unless you're a super big, big five author, usually doesn't get hardbacks. Um, even in YA, there's not a ton of hardbacks um, in bookstores. So <laughs> I have a hardback. It made me so happy. Congratulations. Thank you. And I'll have a link. If you're if hardbacks are your thing and you want to pick one up on Amazon, I'll at least have the link there so you can go check it out. So thank you, Harmony Inc., for giving me my, my very first ever hardback. I was super happy. <laughs> super happy. Do you want to say hardback one last time? Hardback, man. <laughs> if you really want me to, I'll knock on it again. <laughs> okay, moving on. Um, uh, if you've been paying attention to your podcast feed... We had a special bonus episode this past week. 
Yes, we did. Uh, we had the opportunity to talk to Jason T. Caffney, who, of course, has been on the show before, uh, and Kevin Held. And they are the stars of the film Analysis Paralysis, uh, which we've also talked about a few times. We talked about uh, back, I think it was in episode 138, when we actually got to review a screener copy. Uh, the guys are gearing up for a run in the theaters with this movie. Well, a theater. Uh, it's being shown in Palm Springs uh, in a th- at the... Blah, 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 sorry. It's showing in Palm Springs at the Palm Springs Cultural Center as part of the Cinema Diverse Best of the Fest series. It's running from February 1st through the 14th, so it's getting a nice two-week run with multiple showings a day. So if you happen to be in the Palm Springs area, or maybe your travels are taking you through Palm Springs in the next few weeks... Uh, drop in and check out this film. It's such a delight. Uh, there's a special reception and a post-screening Q&A with Jason and Kevin on Friday, February 1st, if you happen to be, again, in the area. Uh, but you could definitely check out the episode. Uh, we talked to them about the movie, the making of the movie, and some of what it means uh, to the overall gay rom-com genre that this movie is actually getting a two-week screening in Palm Springs. We also give you some information on how you can actually get a limited edition DVD of it. So we'll put the link in the show notes to the episode in case you missed it, and uh, you can check that out. Uh, Kevin and Jason will also be back in March to talk about their next movie, Out of Body, which is currently out as a novelization from Suzanne Brockman, and also their podcast, The Bright Side. So something to look forward to in the future. One last thing from this week. Um, I picked up, and some of you may have heard, uh, that Sean T, uh, who is the guy behind fitness programs like Insanity and other crazy workouts that will try to kill you, I know, because I've tried to do these before. Um, <laughs> and his son, uh, his son, his husband, Scott Blocker, uh, are on the cover of the February issue of Parents Magazine. Um, I don't normally pick up Parent Magazines, honestly, and I pick this up Um, to really give them a single-issue purchase uh, to support the fact that they have put this gay couple on the cover of the magazine. There certainly have been the conservative groups that have gone, oh my God, oh my God, there's there's two dads on the cover with their kids. Uh, I can't tell you how delightful this interview with the couple is. Um, They talk about their 12 attempts to get pregnant, what they went through in their first year of having these twins, uh, which included things that they had to do because the twins uh, were born, I believe, I, if I remember right, thir- at 38 weeks. So they were both preemies. Um, how they partner on parenting. It's a delightful article. Uh, and like I said, I bought it because I want to support Parents Magazine in doing more stuff like putting these cu- this couple and couples like them on the cover. So check out the February issue of Parents Magazine on newsstands now. High school hockey player. Computer whiz? Covert agent? Theo Reese's life is split between being a normal teenager and a secret agent who goes by the code name Winger. After years of providing mission support from behind his keyboard, he's thrust into an unexpected world of adventure and danger. In Audio Assault, the third thrilling book in the code name Winger series by Jeff Adams, a family friend needs urgent help. Theo is off to New York City, where he uncovers an insidious plot. Popular song files have been modified to steal personal data and emit a tone that drives some listeners into a homicidal rage. Theo races against the clock to stop the music from causing worldwide chaos. Anna at Gay Book Reviews says, The twists the plot took were so unexpected and exciting that I just couldn't put it down. Get Audio Assault, an ebook or paperback at Amazon and other online retailers. So the first book we want to talk about this week is His Saint by Lucy Lennox. Now, this is, of course, one of the books in her Forever Wild series, a series that we are most certainly a fan of. We've, re- we've uh, reviewed and talked about all of the books in the series. Mm-hmm. Uh, His Saint is wonderful. Uh, continues the fine tradition <laughs> of amazing Lucy Lennox books. Um, this particular volume is about Saint. He is the uh, focus from the Wild family. Mm-hmm. Each book focuses on the member of a, a one of the members of the Wild family. The incredibly extended Wild family. There are like a million billion of these 
wilds yeah. out there. Anyway, so, okay. Um, well, I, I will say that I, if I remember right, at one point it's mentioned that there's ten of them <laughs> between all the brothers and the sisters, and it's like, dang. <laughs> Crazy. Okay, so uh, his saint is about uh, Saint Wild. Uh, he is a former Navy SEAL, and he has to go back to uh, his hometown of Hobie, Texas, uh, to teach a uh, meek and mild antiques dealer some self-defense. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what he's been hired to do. Uh, Augie is the meek and mild um, <laughs> antiques dealer of which we have been speaking. Um, and he has um, set up his shop in Hobie. He is actually a member of a, a particularly wealthy and prominent Texas family. And um, they're all terrible, essentially. <laughs> and so in order to... Ex- ex- what, what's the word I want to use? Not... To, to extricate himself from uh, all of the drama, he uh, has set up shop in Hobie, Texas. Uh, and this is essentially his uh, own attempt to become his own person. Now, the reason that uh, Saint has been hired to teach him um, self-defense is because there was a break-in at Augie's house. And as we learn and uh, as the plot progresses, uh, someone... Uh, we don't necessarily know who is after a particular antique writing desk. There's something about this particular antique that somebody wants, uh, and that's uh, one of the plot points of the book. Mm-hmm. Now, this is essentially uh, what we're talking about is a bodyguard trope, which is, of course, one of my favorites. Technically, Saint isn't hired as a bodyguard. Uh, but that's essentially what's going on in yeah. this story. Uh, so as Saint and Augie spend more and more time together, uh, Saint's like protective instincts kick in uh, and they get closer and closer and are uh, more and more attracted to one another until the fireworks explode uh, and they um, fall in love and uh, find out who the uh, evil perpetrator of crimes against Augie is. Um, one of the, <laughs> um, well, of course, uh, as always, I am a big fan of Lucy Lennox because I think what she excels at is uh, characterization. Um, she uh, excels at uh, pulling the reader in and uh, helping us empathize with whatever uh, issues uh, the characters are facing. And that's certainly no exception in His Saint. Mm-hmm. Um, I like kind of pulling off of that. I mean, the way she creates all this stuff, I want to go live with these people. I want to go live in Hobie, and I want to know the saint, or know the wild, and I want to know the people that they're around. Mm -hmm. Lucy's become one of my go-to comfort read authors. Very much so. And I I think this particular book exemplifies that. Mm -hmm. Like you said, yeah, I don't know what other word I would use other than comforting. Um, Just the way they, they... they connect and interact with one another is really uh, wonderful and sweet and interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the way that their relationship grows throughout the the book is really nice. It's not. I I hate to word the use the word nice, but it is. It's just really nice uh, yeah. to just to see these two guys uh, find their happy ending. One other <laughs> uh, point I want to quickly uh, bring up is is that um, Saint and Augie have uh, some locker room sex in this particular Mm -hmm. book. Um, Not only once, but they do it twice in two separate locker rooms. (laughs) (laughs) True. (laughs) The locker room tour. Um, Which is uh, kind of funny, but incredibly hot at the same time. So, if you happen to have a particular locker room kink, uh, this is probably the book for you. Um, I also want to bring up when it comes to uh, Lucy Lennox and her the exceptional way that she uh, uh, draws characters um, is that Augie is essentially, I will say, a gay sex version. Virgin. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, Saint Saint takes care of him real good. Um, yeah. What there <laughs> there is a particularly long and protracted chapter in the middle of the book uh, where not only Augie essentially loses his virginity, but they have sex several times. And in between each time, they uh, sort of have some pillow talk where they sort of talk about um, their, what essentially are character motivations and plot points 
uh, involving the romantic suspense elements, um, which the way I'm describing it sounds really stupid and kind of boring, but uh, because Lucy is so good at what she does, uh, she makes this uh, really long chapter really interesting mm -hmm. and really compelling and an integral part of the uh, story as a whole. Yeah, I really like what she did, and you hinted to this a little bit ago. Augie has amazing growth in this book. Oh, yeah. I mean, he goes, yeah. he's still your meek, mild antique dealer at the end of it, mm -hmm. but he's a much more confident meek and mild. He can, <laughs> he finds a way to bring it out when he needs it, mm -hmm. and he really grows into, he always knew who he was, but he really grows into himself more uh, because of Saint. And, and Saint has a great arc, too, because he figures out that he doesn't... There's more to life than hookups for him, mm -hmm. which is delightful. Um, there's an amazing reveal in this book that sets up the next book, which is the long-awaited Grandpa book, which I don't think I'm talking out of school of, because I think Lucy's mentioned the Grandpas are next uh, on social media for this. Um, uh, for so for those of you who have not read any of the mm -hmm. Wild series, uh, Doc and Grandpa are essentially the patriarchs of the wild family uh and they have figured heavily in the uh plots and experiences of um all of the characters in all of the wild books uh and super fans of the series have been begging lucy for uh, essentially their uh origin story we want to know how doc and grandpa met yeah. and how they fell in love and how they created this uh wonderful uh family uh in this small town in texas uh, and this particular book um, open essentially there's a big reveal like Jeff just said and it opens the door to the possibility yeah. of uh, this book because I think logically I think there was when it for Lucy there was a uh, the Doc and Grandpa book would have to be either told in a lot of flashback or essentially be a historical book because it, you know, the entire story takes, you know, place in the past. Um, but the big reveal, the sort of surprise that happens uh, in this book, uh, opens the door in a really interesting way. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we're looking yeah. forward to that. I will. I will tell you as I hit this. There was a. I actually had to back up the audio book <laughs> to be like, did I just see that? Did that just? Did that just happen? Uh, and then I messaged Lucy, going, Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> Which was a little ridiculous. I don't really do that to authors when I hit like some big jaw-dropping moment. But I'm like, I, that was so awesome. Uh, so really looking forward to that. And just one last note as we as we wrap up on his saint. Uh, we both listened to the audio. Um, <laughs> Michael Pauly does his usual tremendous job. And I know we've had Hudson and Charlie's book. But I could listen to Michael do Charlie's accent any day of the week. So if there's a way to get more Charlie to these books, Lucy, can we do that so that Michael can do that? Just say, thank you. Uh, so I think we both wholeheartedly recommend His Saint by Lucy Lennox. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So our second book this week, as we continue, um, the book that we both managed to read at the same time, uh, we have a book that uh, I know I was attracted to right away because it takes place uh, set with a backdrop of Broadway. And it's See the Light by Kate McMurray, who we'll actually be hearing from in just a few minutes. Uh, this book is um, a good, a, it, it's a really good friends to lovers romance uh, set in the heart of New York City and with Broadway as a backdrop for both characters. Uh, Jeremy and Max have been friends. I believe at one point they said since they were like six or seven. I mean, they, they grew up together. They came to the city together. They've had a long history of coming into the city to see Broadway shows, which was their obsession. Uh, since I think it was they saw Evita <laughs> at some point in like their middle school age. Uh, Jeremy's become an actor, uh, and he's out on the audition circuit all the time uh, looking for the next job uh, and looking for his break. Uh, Max actually owns his own makeup studio and has been designing makeup for Broadway shows for some time. Uh, but he also is looking for a kind of the thing that will make his name. And uh, as we open the book, Jeremy's been dumped by his uh, boyfriend of two years, and he ends up on Max's couch. And it turns out that Max has had a long harbored crush 
on Jeremy. Uh, unfortunately, this is something that he's never bothered to tell Jeremy uh, over the years, and he's kept it to himself. And suddenly having Jeremy on his couch has really brought all this up for him uh, now that they're living uh, in this in this you know teeny tiny Brooklyn apartment uh, where there's you know just barely enough space to turn around <laughs> essentially. Um, both guys uh, pretty rapidly end up with their big opportunity. Jeremy has an opportunity to star in, a, in an important new musical, uh, and at the same time, uh, Max's studio gets the chance to do some makeup on a big kind of Lord of the Rings type uh, musical. So as they're both now living together and uh, really driving towards their uh, their big career moments, they realize that you know Jeremy finally clicks into the fact that he's got this really good friend and he's got he does have feelings for Max, and uh, so they end up trying to get this relationship going in the midst of all the career stuff, and and Max, uh, poor Max, he's so confident in his career but he's not really confident in the relationship department and he keeps questioning the moves that he's making and and questioning what Jeremy's doing and because he doesn't want to be the rebound guy he wants this thing with Jeremy to be the real deal and at the same time he doesn't want to lose his friend of you know some you know 15 to 20 years at this point uh, and it makes for some really nice um chemistry between the two because from the get-go you see the type friends that they are and all the history that they share with everything and the the history of their of their love lives and and all of it because they've seen it unfold for each other uh so their chemistry is one of the things that you know sold me on this you know so much in the in the get-go because they're freaking cute <laughs> and they root for each other like friends do to get their career thing uh you know kicked off and really moving because this will be it for both of them uh, if, it, if it turns out. So, yeah, I really enjoyed that aspect of the book. Uh, what are some of your initial kind of thoughts on it? Um, I really think this is a lovely example of the classic friends to lovers trope. And as mm -hmm. you were just speaking of, um, the journey of these two characters is really um, endearing. Um, partly because of... <sighs> Um, Max's angst about his, you know, long-held torch for his best friend, and then Jeremy, Jeremy, Jeremy's <laughs> um, uh, uh, slow dawning realization that um, that Max may, even though Jeremy's been searching for the one probably for a really long time, he finally is like, oh, wait, this guy that I spend all my time with and this guy that I really, really like, maybe he is actually the one. And he's been in front of me all this time. Mm -hmm. It's really delightful. And the fact that it does have the Broadway backdrop, you know, as soon as you told me about the book and I read the book, I'm like, yep, need that right now. Uh, Kate knows her musicals <clears throat> and, and she did the research to properly, you know, kind of create the world and create the background. Uh, she'll talk about some of the research that she did in the interview coming up, and it's kind of astounding just the the material she created for herself to be able to give life to these characters in the book. So I really enjoyed that. And Max has an amazing uh, drag performer friend and actually ex uh, by the name of Anthony. And Anthony added a lot to me for this book because he was the one who called out Max on all of his crap. Um, he was the one who was like, dude, come on, you, you got to go for what you want here and not just, you know, essentially kind of live in your fear moment that you're, you're going to lose a friend. You got to just pick up and do it. Uh, he's a great supporting character. I would love to see Kate maybe give Anthony his own book at some point because mm -hmm. um, I think that would be a lot of fun. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. So we both very much recommend See the Light by Kate McMurray. Did you know that podcasts love to get reviews too? Taking a moment to leave a review about the Big Gay Fiction Podcast helps us with the show's visibility online. Please take a moment to visit iTunes and leave a review. Your comments help other readers of gay romance discover this show. Thanks for helping us spread the word about the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. So as we've alluded to the entire show, we got to talk to Kate about See the Light. And we also took a few minutes to find out how she got her start and the authors who influenced her path to gay romance. Welcome, Kate, to the podcast. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you for having me. 
Now, you have a new book out this week uh, with Broadway as a backdrop. So that, of course, got our attention immediately. Um, <laughs> tell us all about See the Light. So uh, See the Light is the story of an aspiring Broadway actor named Jeremy who's just been dumped. And he moves in with his best friend who has been holding a torch for him for quite a while. And uh, they have some romance. Uh, so Jeremy's an aspiring actor and he gets his big break in the course of the novel. And Max is a theatrical makeup artist. So they're both involved in theater in some way. What was your inspiration for the book? So a, a bunch of things happened all at the same time. Um, so I, I saw Dear Evan Hansen on Broadway about a year ago um, and was obsessed because like, the music is amazing. I, I I walked out of the theater and immediately downloaded the cast recording to my phone so that I could listen to it on the subway ride home. Like, just the whole thing. Um, yeah, it, it's it's such a great show. And then um, around the same time, I got back in touch with a kid that I used to babysit, who is 28 now, so he's not a kid, but uh, he's also an aspiring actor. And he does, he lives in another city, but he comes to New York every spring. Well, I guess audition season starts about now, but he like couch surfs in the city and does all these auditions. So he was telling me what the process is like. And I was like, well, that's really, I never would have guessed. Like basically most Broadway auditions happen in this like very short period of time. Um, And he was just like doing three or four, like just showing up for three or four auditions a day. And I thought that was really interesting. And then I, I had to come up with a story for this second novel that I was I owed Karina Press. So I was sitting down to brainstorm one day, and I had a RuPaul's Drag Race marathon on in the background. <laughs> so I think that's how the makeup artist got into it. Ah, oh, um, okay. <laughs> so I was so I was just sitting here like like just brainstorming, and I came, this story sort of came together that way. Um, and and so it was all these different elements. And then last year I saw more theater than I have in a while, so it was like. It was, which was awesome and amazing, and I'm so glad that I got the opportunity to see all these shows. I mean, especially since I live in New York, and I, I don't go to Broadway that often, all things considered. So um, so that was that was a big part of, like, all those things kind of gelling at the same time is sort of what produced the book. And it's clear that you love musicals. You could just tell that <laughs> from the book itself. It's layered up with all these details and all these show references um, and yet I don't think it's too much that people who are maybe like Mm-mm, on Broadway won't go, Oh God, what's this? <laughs> you know? It's like you didn't yeah, overwrite it at the same cool. time. Yeah. Uh, that, I mean, that, I was, I hope that, I mean, that's true too. Like I, I tend to sort of go all in on settings. So like I, I always worried about that without in the field and baseball too. Like, is this a little too much detail, but then people, as long as you understand the story that I think that's what matters. And then there's all those references there so that, uh, people who are Broadway fans can be like, oh, I know what that is. And you went so far to actually do a complete song list. There's a po- blog post on your site where you detail like the entire song list behind See the Light. And, you know, the plot is heavily detailed in the book. What led you to create so much detail? So I I wanted to like really flesh out the whole story. Like I, I had to know for myself what the musical was about and um, for those of you who haven't read the book yet, it's it's about it's sort of a cross between Dear Evan Hansen and Love Simon, and then the Parkland shooting kids get involved because that was happening while I was writing the book. So it all sort of all these different th- elements sort of. And I I wrote out the story, and then when I originally pitched the story to Karina, one of the things that they really responded to was that the show had some parallels with the plot of the book. So I wanted to make sure that I knew what those parallels were when I was writing so that it would be like really clear what the, what that was. And so I needed to know for myself what the plot of this musical was. I knew that I'd be referring to it. I felt like I needed to know the song names. I don't know. I have a lot of notes for all of my projects that sometimes make it into the book and sometimes don't. But I thought that in this case, it was useful for me to know like who was singing when, who the different parts were, which actor played which part. And I have like several pages of notes with all of this information in it so that, uh, so just, and I had my notebook with me for reference while I was writing. And so all of that sort of got woven into the story. And um, yeah, so I, I wanted to, I don't know, just make sure that there's, I like, I like stories that have a lot of detail to them. So I like to reflect that in my writing. So that was a, that was a big reason why and even I think 
like I teach a class on world building and I always tell writers, like even if it doesn't make it into the story, the fact that you know it will sort of be reflected in how you write about your characters. So yeah, I like to have that information. Yeah. Now in the book, when uh, the character Jeremy gets his big break in See the Light, um, Max is also working on a different show at the same time, like a big, yeah. splashy, expensive fantasy show called Sword of Dawn. Um, how much detail did you come up with that show? Much less. I didn't flip <laughs> that out nearly as much. I mean, it's it's kind of a – the whole show is – that show is sort of a mashup of high fantasy tropes, so it's kind of like <laughs> Lord of the Rings meets Game of Thrones meets Wheel of Time just like all kind of got messed together. And I, I have a list of like who the creatures are that Max was making makeup for, but I don't, I don't know what the plot of that show is. I think it's like, I'm sure it's like a pretty typical hero's journey kind of plot, mm-hmm. but I, I also felt like it was the, it was a less important show. So I didn't need to know as much about it, but um, I, I just, mostly what I needed to know was what kind of creatures Max was making. And then I drew a lot from Julie Taymor for that. Cause I thought, well, there probably puppets get involved. And uh, I've seen a few Julie Taymor productions, and they they have these just amazing costumes, and they're really elaborate. And they're um, she did uh, she did the Magic Flute at the Met uh, Opera a few years ago, or not? This was probably ten years ago, and the, the costumes for that were really amazing. So I was trying to keep all of that in mind, but yeah, I don't I don't know what the plot is for that. <laughs> As I was reading, I really wanted the dragon to be on the scale of King Kong, <laughs> since Kong is all the thing on oh, Broadway that'd be right cool. now. I think in my head it's sort of like proportionally like what you know like like a Chinese dragon in a parade it's sort of that okay. size but that like yeah I, <laughs> and it's interesting just be one person I don't know <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting watching Jeremy and Max on their trajectories to each other while they're both going for essentially their big breaks it's certainly the big break for yeah. Jeremy and Max too is I mean, it's going to be a big deal for a studio to work on this project. Right. Right. And and I feel, felt like they're, you know, you're, I think they're at the point in their lives when, like, you sort of start getting your first real big success. Like, you know, especially if it's something you've been working for for a long time. And I, I don't know, I thought, and also, I think I just needed a really happy ending. So, like, I needed everything to kind of work out for the character when I was writing the book. So so the big question here is, if, if the book itself was to be made into the musical, who are you casting as Jeremy and Max? Okay, so I think for Jeremy, I would pick somebody who's kind of like more clean cut. I think for Jeremy, I would pick a, a Gavin Creel or an Aaron Tveit. Um And then for Max, I was thinking maybe Ben Platt. But like I don't, that's not a great fit. But then I was running out of Broadway actors I could think of. So. <laughs> I'm terrible at casting these kinds of things because my characters like they don't like they're so so specific in my head that I I can never find actors who really add like look like who the characters are. So spinning back to your beginnings, what got you started in it in MMM romance? So uh, I think my path is a little bit less. Traditional. I don't know. I I uh, I have a, an English lit degree, and after college, I was a little bit of a snob about books for a while. But I got back into reading genre fiction when I was like in my mid twenties, and um, I got my start reading mysteries again. And then I kind of dipped my toe into romance, be it romantic suspense first. So um, two things kind of happened at the same time. I was reading Suzanne Brockman's Troubleshooter series. And got to the Jules Robin storyline around the same time that I read a book review online for Josh Lanyon's Adrian English series. And so I read both of those books. This is probably, this was like in the gay romance dark ages. So this is maybe 2008, yeah. 2009. And I, I read those both around the same time. And I liked them so much that I then went and tried to find whatever other gay romance existed. And there was not a lot at the time. So I thought, well... I guess I have to write one. And it, it's funny, too, because I never intended for all of my books to have gay pairings. It's just sort of worked out that way in terms of my career so far. But uh, it's, just, it's just like those are the stories that have come into my head. But that's that's sort of where I was coming from. And I think that I also 
one of the things I like about gay romance is that you, it's it's happy endings for characters that you haven't seen a lot in romance novels or in other stories prior to this. And you know, I I read a lot of LGBT fiction in college, and it all ends in unbearable tragedies. So it's nice to see like these happier stories happen. Um, so that that's sort of how I arrived at it. And I um and I I love romance novels. I love love stories and um I don't know why I thought that I was above writing them for a while but uh um yeah, I just I love the genre and I want to keep writing in it. So that's where I am right now. Were you writing before in other genres or was it really the these books that inspired you to write in general? No, I had been writing before. I started writing. I mean, I I've been writing stories forever. I, I wrote a novel when I was 17 that I'm sure was hot garbage. And then I, uh, w after college, I was dipping my toe into writing. Like I, I thought I was writing the great American novel and then it, it wasn't, that also wasn't very good. And I had a lot of false starts and then I, I figured out that I was writing romance. So I, I wrote a couple of romantic suspense novels that were also hot garbage. And then, um, it just happened that like, I decided one year, like January 1st, I was like, this is the year I'm going to finish a novel and submit it to a publisher. And that book was In Hot Pursuit, which was my first published novel. And so, and I I probably had written and not published like a half dozen books before that, that just like were not good enough to see the light of day. And that, then this book, I finally felt like I had something that was good enough to submit somewhere. So that, yeah, but I'd, I'd been writing, like I, my, my first few attempts at romance were het romances. And I'm developing a het romance series right now, actually, but I I don't know what's happening with that at the moment. So no more details on that for now. I believe I read, too, and correct me if I'm wrong, In Hot Pursuit's getting ready to re-release, right? Yeah, I, I uh, it because Lucid closed last year, and the I had two books that were still with Lucid that the rights reverted to. Um, and I've been very slow about putting them back out because, like, I was so busy last, last year. Um, but I finally was like, no, this, I have to get this done now. So uh, I decided that I wanted to get in Hot Pursuit out on its publication anniversary, which is in February. So yeah, it's it's uploaded everywhere. I have to. I'm still waiting for it to show up in all the stores, and then it'll be up for pre-order coming out for real in February. Um, and I I didn't change this edition very much. It's like I, I like I read through it and fixed anything that was like goofy or or like. But characters still had flip phones because I wrote it in 2009 or like anything weird. Like I fixed a couple of those things, but the, the story is pr pretty substantially the same. Who are your major author influences? So I, I have two answers for this, which are I have like the, the elitist snobby answer and then I have like the the better answer. But <laughs> uh, one, one thing that I, I think a lot about in my in my writing, so I, I – um, I wrote my thesis on Toni Morrison and one of the things that happens in her books that I really appreciate is that like as she publishes more books, she becomes more confident in herself as a writer. So for example, in The Blue Sky, which was her first novel, it's very like, she kind of spells everything out for you. Like the, the metaphor is a little bit like on the nose and um, she, it's more telling and less showing. But by the time she gets to Beloved or Paradise, she's, leaving much more up to the reader to interpret. So I try to think about that when I'm writing. Like, I never want to hit the reader over the head. I want to sort of like, here's the story. You can interpret it however you want. I also have a ton of favorite romance writers. Um, my particular romance drug of choice are historical romances, uh, which don't, which are not like super directly influential because I'm kind of doing a different thing. But I love writers like... Laura Kinsale is one of my favorites of all time, or Sarah McLean. I don't read as much romantic suspense as I used to, but I I love Suzanne Brockman. Like she's one of my writer heroes. And there are a lot of earlier gay romance authors that I really appreciate. Like Zay Maxfield, I think was one of the first writers I ever discovered. Or um, I read I read Fest and Faith and Fidelity a million like before I even met Terry Michaels, and uh, and I love Heidi Cullinan's earlier books too. Everything I read probably influences me in some way. I think by this point I've really developed my own voice and my own style, but um, yeah, I, I just love all those books. Mm -hmm. I wish I had more time for reading because mm -hmm. I really just don't read more. <laughs> so many books. What's the trademark of a Kate McMurray book? Well, I think, I think that I really like to try to 
really feel immersed in the worlds that I'm creating. So I, I do a ton of research and um, I really want books to have strong settings. And I think that's really what you'll find, whether like regardless of what genre I'm dabbling in. Um, and I, I try to write characters that aren't like, like I'm, I'm probably not ever going to publish a billionaire book. You know what I mean? Like I try to sort of write characters that are pretty down to earth. So I think those are my trademarks. Yeah, certainly for me and see the light, it's very clear you know New York well. I mean, obviously you live there anyway, but yeah. I, could, I, I envisioned easily everywhere we were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I live in Brooklyn and, and Brooklyn, I feel like doesn't, doesn't make its way into books very often. And then um, I put I put Max's apartment right where a friend of mine lives. And she and her fiance live in this apartment that's like, it's tiny, but the building is amazing. <laughs> so I'm, I'm always like, and it's like right behind the Barclays Center. One of the things happening in Brooklyn right now is there's so much gentrification and I live in like not at all cool Brooklyn. So <laughs> it's, it's sort of a different, I've sort of pictured that was where Jeremy and his ex's apartment was was sort of where I live now. And um, he's sort of, and it's, it's a very subtle, like you would only get this if you live in New York kind of thing. But he ends up moving to this apartment near the Barclays Center, which is in a part of Brooklyn that's developing like crazy right now. And it's all fancy. And there's like a Whole Foods and a Trader Joe's. And it's like, it's very, it's a million Poke Bowl places. Like that's like, a, it's a <laughs> weird thing that's happening in downtown Brooklyn right now. So that was sort of like on the brain when I was picking the setting. And I feel like Brooklyn, as I experience it, is just like never shows up in books. So I wanted to make sure that was in there somewhere. Yeah, it was nice to, to not just get all New York all the time. New York City, pro Manhattan proper anyway. We'll call it yeah. Manhattan in this case. Because, <laughs> I mean, I, I also just like from a logical perspective, Manhattan is like so bonkers expensive that like an aspiring actor who doesn't work that much would not be able to afford an apartment there. So, and I've I've read that book too, where there's a character who like, lives on the 17th floor on a building in the, on the Upper East Side with a doorman. And I was like, there's no way on earth this character could afford that. It, stuff like that really bugs me. So I always try to be really realistic with New York details in the books that I'm writing. Are there tropes or, you know, subgenres that you want to play with that you haven't yet? Uh, so I really want to write um, more historical romance. I've written two, but I want, I want to write more, um, and I really love the idea of writing American set historicals. And this is one of my crusades is I just want there to be more books set in the States. Uh, and right now, like, like just generally speaking, not even specifically gay romance, but romance generally, it's so heavily dominated by Regency romance. And I love a Regency romance. This is not a knock on them at all, but I want to see more other kinds of books. Like just as a reader, I'd like to read them. But I want to write more historicals, too, because I'm a huge history nerd and I want to, like, incorporate that into it. But um, I also have a crazy idea for a paranormal series that I'd like to write at some point. I don't know when that will be, but I like the idea of following the same couple through the whole series. That's something I'd like to attempt at some point. I don't know when that will be, but, yeah. Somewhere that's, out that's there something in the future. I'm <laughs> Somewhere, yeah. I'm young. I have time. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of time. People may not know that besides the writing, I mean, you're also heavily involved in the author community. You're, you're yeah. the former president of the Rainbow Writers, Rainbow Romance Writers, and you're also the current president of the New York City Romance Writers of America chapter. Why is all of that important to you to take well, on those roles? I'm, I'm actually currently the past president of the New York chapter. I, uh, it's still a voting position. I still go to board meetings and stuff, but... Um, yeah, I'm, I don't get to be the president anymore. They have term limits. <laughs> they made me leave. <laughs> uh, but, um, I mean, it it's interesting. New York has this, like, really great romance community. Um, and when I was first starting to write, um, I, well, I participated in NaNoWriMo many times. And I used to be the liaison for New York City. Um, and through that, I met some women who were members of the local RWA chapter, and they kind of talked me into joining. And for like a year, I didn't do anything with my membership. I was just like, oh, it's fine. Like, it's a thing I belong to. And I paid my dues. But then um, a weird thing happened where there was a scandal. And I don't remember all of the details, but the the gist of it is that there was this RWA chapter that disinvited gay romance authors from submitting to their contest. And it was a big scandal. 
And I think by then I was already a member of Rainbow Romance Writers. And this might have been when Heidi Cullinan was the president. I don't, it might have been the year before that. I don't remember. Time just like blends together. But, uh, but around the time that that was happening, the president of the New York City chapter released a statement where she said basically that the New York New York's contest would always be open to everyone. And I thought, well, that's really nice. Like, and then it came up in the schedule that Terry Michaels was going to be a guest speaker, and I had never met her before at the time. And I, but I had read Faith and Fidelity, and I was really excited that there was a gay romance author who was going to be speaking. So I finally went to the meeting, and um, now Terry's one of my best friends. But uh, the but through that meeting, I was like, oh, well, this is exciting. And I met all these really great people and these writers who were just like at all different stages of their careers. And um, it was just a really great experience. And we do, the local chapter does a bunch of networking events and educational programs. And I learned a ton and I got to meet all these great people. And the amazing thing about living in New York is that this is where publishing is. So I got to meet all these editors and agents and like I had all these great opportunities. And then uh, I decided to run for the board because like after I'd gotten all that, I wanted to give something back and volunteer my time. And also <laughs> because uh, David Swade and Heidi Cullinan got me drunk on margaritas and talked me into running for the RW board. Oh, you should that's never be drunk story. around those two because you never know what's going <laughs> to <No>, happen. <laughs> then they'll talk you into something, but that's, that's what happened. And so I, I ran for the Rainbow Romance Writers Board and one of the things I realized being a part of that chapter is that I could, I realized that I could affect real change. And because one of the stated missions of that chapter was to advocate for LGBTQ romance writers. And each year the president kind of has an, like a big agenda item with the way we were setting it up. And so my, when I was president of the chapter, I was really interested in doing library outreach and finding out how to get more LGBTQ books into libraries and what the impediments to that were and like letting librarians know that we existed uh, and like, and so that was a big deal to me. And I did it. I talked to bookstores too. I talked to a lot of indie bookstores and about like how, you know, and sort of learning uh, this is changing, but for a long time, indie bookstores wouldn't stock romance at all. Uh, despite the fact that, they've hosted a whole bunch of romance panels now. The Strand still doesn't really have romance in their bookstores at all, which is crazy to me. Like There's everything else in there. Like, <laughs> I know. it's <laughs> Well, and they've, and they've had, like, once a quarter or so for the last year and a half, maybe, they've had these panels of romance writers at the store. And, so it's, and they stock those books, and they last for as long as those copies are there. But they don't really have a romance section. But anyway, I was doing a lot of that kind of work, and then um, then this opportunity to run for the board of the local chapter happened, and New York is such a great, like, it's a great community of writers, but the New York chapter is super diverse in terms of the races of the people who are members, in terms of gender, sexuality, in terms of what people are writing, everything from inspirationals to erotic romance and all the things in between in terms of indie and traditional and not published yet and have made bestseller lists like it's this great community and um i really wanted to foster that and this also has let me like getting involved in rwa has also let me do some work to advocate for more diversity in the romance genres generally which i think makes the genre better like the more voices we have the better the genre is and um, so that's sort of what I'm working toward. And I'm currently serving on several committees within RWA. Um, I hope to run for the board again, the national board at some point in the future. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been just a really rewarding experience. So I enjoy being involved with that. Plus it's, it's good to have writer friends, <laughs> just like mm -hmm. people you can talk to about like what you're going through, what you're doing, like people who hold you accountable, all of that stuff. And so, yeah, it's really good to have, have that community. You also teach as part of this giving back. Um, how yeah. did that kind of get started? Career background. I, I work in publishing in my other life, but uh, I had wanted to teach for a while and I applied to grad school and then decided I didn't want to go to school anymore. So I ended up not going to school for teaching, but I thought about it. And then I did some volunteer work where I was helping kids um, there's a, I worked with a 
an organization in New York that um, was helping uh, kids get into college. And I really just liked teaching. And then I got this opportunity that happened uh, for the, the GRL that was in Atlanta. And that was, uh, again, Heidi and Dame, Damon sat me down and were like, so you, you're going to do this. Uh, I don't think I was drunk that time, but we were at dinner. And I wound up taking the lead in putting together the writer's track for that GRL. That was when I was the... I think that was when I was the vice president of Rainbow Romance Writers, and Rainbow Romance Writers were sort of sponsoring the writer's track. So they told me, like, well, you should teach a class. And so I thought about, like, well, so what am I good at and what can I teach? And then I, that was really the first time that I'd done a workshop at a writing conference. And then after that, I just, you know, I put proposals together. And, I mean, I have to give Damon a lot of credit because he's talked me into a lot of these things. But um, he's always right. Like, there are such great opportunities both to, like, just to get back and to, you know, share knowledge, but also, you know, to meet a lot of new writers. I And I'm teaching, I think, I'm only doing two cons this year, which is way less than usual. <laughs> um, but I'm teaching workshops at both of them. So it's the same workshop, though. So hopefully that'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> now, besides See the Light and, and, hot, and In Hot Pursuit coming back out, what else do we have to look forward to in... 2019 from you? Well, 2019 is a little slow. Um, it's funny, the way that publishing works is that if you have a year where you don't write very much, um, there's a weird ripple effect. So uh, 2016, I know was a dumpster fire for everyone. Um, it was a particularly bad year for me because I moved in the middle of it and like I didn't write for like four months. And so we're sort of feeling the reverberations of that now because I don't have much on the schedule. But what I'm planning right now is to... I have another Lucid book, which is a novella called Save the Date that I would like to get back out for, it's also out of print. I'd like to get that back up like June-ish, hopefully is, is the schedule right now. Um, that's a, it's a, it's a novella. I've, I've expanded it a little bit. I don't think it's going to end up being novel length. I think it's probably going to be between 40,000 and 50,000 words, but it's a, it's a romantic comedy about a wedding. And then, uh, and it's sort of, it's a weird, this is a weird personal story for me because I wrote that novella when my ex got married. And so it was sort of my way of like dealing with it. But at the same time, it's a comedy. <laughs> so there's that. But then, uh, so I hope to get that out around June. Fingers crossed. It sort of depends on how the rest of my schedule goes. And then I want to release another novella probably in the fall, but I don't know what that is yet. It's more sort of a like filler in the, hole in my publication schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, I have some ideas, but I don't, I don't know yet, but I'm going to be putting that out myself. So I have a little time to decide still. And, and we can also look out into 2020 because it was recently announced yeah. that you've got some, some stories coming out to align with the Olympics and it all starts I with do. something called here comes the flood. So I'm so excited for the series. I can't even tell you. I am a nerd about a lot of things. So musicals, but also sports. And I love the Olympics. And uh, so Here Comes the Flood is a book about uh, he's one hero is an alcoholic swimmer who hit rock bottom, had a few DUIs. And then for this Olympics, has decided to stage a comeback. And then the other hero is a diver who's gotten a lot of tabloid attention and is not that into it and just sort of like wants to get through the games and do his thing and go home and not have anyone bother him. And so I wrote this book during the 2016 Olympics, the Summer Olympics, because I like it really was I woke up one morning and this whole story was in my head. And like I literally like in my pajamas crossed the apartment and sat at my desk and wrote it all out, like wrote out a synopsis. And um, but we i have been sitting on the manuscript for a while and then I was shopping for agents and there was a lot of minutia with scheduling. And then when I, I sat down and pitched it to Lynn West at Dream Spinner and she was like, oh my God, give me. <laughs> so it's a three book series. They're all coming out in 2020. The first one I think is out in the spring, but I don't remember the pub date offhand. So here comes the flood will be out in the spring. Book two uh, is going to be called Stick the Landing. It's uh, about a gymnast. And then book three has a title I don't remember offhand. It's like Race for Redemption or something like that. And it's about a uh, track runner. So those will be out next summer. Uh, and then I actually have another trilogy coming out in 2021 <laughs> that are very loosely based on 
I've been signing lots of contracts. This is why I wanted to write a novella this year so that like <laughs> there's lots of stuff happening. But the the 2021 trilogy is sort of based on a fake HGTV, so it's about like people who renovate houses on television. And then if if the gods are nice to me, I want to release another trilogy of Olympic books for the Winter Olympics in 2022, but uh, I don't have that contracted yet. <laughs> it's just sort of in the vague future plans list. I'm really excited, and um, the Olympics books have been really fun to write. I just finished the second one. Or I have a draft done. I have to revise it still, but um, there's that one I think is going to be really fun. And I got to be super nerdy about gymnastics, so... And it turns out that if you ever need to know what any gymnastics move looks like, it, they're all on YouTube. So. Oh, for sure. Everything's on YouTube. <laughs> Everything's on YouTube. So I watched a lot of gymnastics videos on YouTube when I was writing this book. I, I'm worried at this point that there's a little too much and I have to tone it back a little But because uh, people are going to be like, what are all these Russian words? Like they're all, <laughs> all the names in gymnastics, like all these release moves and stuff all have names. But <laughs> I can go in the deleted scenes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's all the extra stuff that you don't care about. <laughs> so what's the best way to keep up with you online so folks can follow along with all these releases coming out? I am the most active on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at uh, Kate McM writer. This, you can find all this on my website. I'm on Facebook sometimes, and I've, I joined Instagram last fall. Uh, it's mostly pictures of my cat, but all of, all of my usernames and stuff are on my website. You can find me from there, which is just katemcmurray.com. All right. Fantastic. Well, Kate, thank you so much for hanging out with us. It's been great to hear about See the Light, plus everything else that's coming up soon. You're welcome. Thanks again to Kate for hanging out with us and giving us her origin story and all about See the Light. I in particular loved, besides hearing about the book, how she got into RWA and all the work that she does uh, to give back to the community and teach new writers and everything like that. It was it was really tremendous. Yeah, so. I, I'm really glad we had the chance to talk to her. Yes. Okay, here we got everyone. I think this is going to do it for this week's episode. Uh, just a quick note before we go. We want to remind you that you can help support the Big Gay Fiction Podcast with a monthly pledge through Patreon. For as little as 25 cents an episode, your pledge helps pay for the costs of producing and distributing this show. And for your support, you get access to our monthly bonus episodes. You also have the opportunity to ask questions of some of our upcoming guests. Uh, and there's a whole lot more. You can get all the details at patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. So be sure and check that out if you have the chance. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys. Coming up next week, we have Coastal Magic featured author Kiernan Kelly. And we'll talk about what she's looking forward to at the convention and what book she's got planned coming up in 2019. Yes. Looking forward to that conversation. Yeah, it's going to be really good. So everyone, remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter when you have a book. Until next time, everyone, please keep turning those pages and keep reading. For detailed show notes and links to everything discussed in this episode, go to BigGayFictionPodcast.com. New episodes are available every Monday at all major podcast distributors. You can also find us on YouTube, I'm Derek McLean. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.